Hi everybody, I'm Sebastian, I'm working for Intel and I'll be talking today about building a VMware in Rust for the Edge. So let's get started with um, the need for security. So we're going to look at the reason why we need security in the virtualization use case. Then we'll look at two pillars uh, to, to achieve the security that we're looking for, uh, which are Rust and Rust VMM. Um, then we'll look at different use cases that we have at the edge, uh, namely uh, the pet versus uh, cattle VM use case. Um, and we'll finish the presentation diving into the details of the Cloud Advisor uh, project as well as the Rust Hypervisor framework. Let's look at this need for security. So uh, if you look at a virtualization stack, um, we have two types possible, the type one and the type two. In the case of the type one, you have the hardware on which um, an hypervisor is running. And because this hypervisor is uh, has access to the full hardware, uh, since it's running in ring zero, it can uh, completely interact with it and create uh, virtual machines um, on demand. Uh, there are multiple projects implementing type ones, such as Zen, Akron, ESXi from VMware, and Hyper-V from Microsoft. On the other side, we have the type two use case. Uh, it's slightly different because on top of the hardware here, it's not the hypervisor directly, but an operating system. So we'll take the example of Linux with KVM. And so the hypervisor is basically a kernel module inside your uh, in your inside your kernel, um, and on top of this, you need a user space layer, um, so the VMM, uh, to to interact with the guests, and more than that, to actually create the VMs. Um, the point is to let uh, user space be able to run virtual machines directly, um, and so when you look at it. Um, a lot of things, such as the device model and the communication uh, between host and guest, is done through this VMM. That's why it's so important to, to get the VMM uh, secure properly. And so just a quick comparison between the two types, where we can see that in the, in the type to use case, the VMM is a quite important piece in the, in the virtualization stack. So we talked about um, why the VMM is important. Now let's talk about what. Well, you we have this typical situation in uh, in all CSPs where CSPs owns. So by CSP, I mean cloud service provider, of course. Um, a CSP owns large amount of hardware, and on these servers, they're basically running loads of VMs for different tenants uh, or, or customers. Um, and what they don't want is a potential malicious guest to be able to escape from the virtualization uh, layer and attack the hardware, which would cause some sort of denial of service, um, would also be able to access data from other VMs. Uh, so that means that it could store data from other Customers, um, so they definitely want to strengthen the the whole uh, stack uh, that they propose to their customer. Uh, let's now look at the pillar that we're going to rely on to achieve this security. So the first one is Rust, and the main point about Rust is that, so first it's kind of a new kid on the block, even if it's not, because it's been there for 10 years. Um, but it's only recently that like big companies have started acknowledging the fact that Rust is the right language for critical projects who require, which require um, high security. And the main selling point for Rust is the memory safety um, that's provided by, by its Rust compiler, um, there is a concept of memory ownership that basically gives you uh, memory safety for free, um, and the program won't even compile if if you don't follow this this ownership um, 
group. Uh, because of this, uh, there is no more issue in having your program trying to access memory after it's been it's been freed or trying to access un uninitialized memory. All these matters are actually taken care of by um, compile compiler upfront. The second uh, very interesting thing about Frost is that it's fully performant, uh, and you can compare that to a simple C program. Um, it's just as efficient because there is no garbage collection involved in Rust. Uh, so we get security and we get performance. Um, the, the last interesting thing about Rust is how you manage uh, dependencies. Uh, so dependencies in Rust are called crates, and there's a tool uh, provided by, um, by Rust called Cargo. And this this tool uh, just helps like the developers with the maintenance burden um, of of updating crates, uh, which means that you get like security kind of free by by making sure uh, that it's uh, your project is easily updated with the latest versions of of the dependency you have. The second big player in uh, building a secure VMM is Rust VMM. So this is a project started three years ago um, by um, the different stakeholders in, in this field where um, basically we had like Google, um, Fire, uh, <laughs> AWS, and Intel all trying to build um, a VMM in Rust. Uh, we obviously had different use cases and scope, scopes in mind. And that's why we couldn't contribute to each other project. But what we wanted to do is to uh, rely on the same core components. And that's what Rust VMM is really. It's a set of common components that can be reused across multiple VMM projects. Um, and so here you can see a list of those uh, traits that are uh, proposed by Rust VMM. And in the context of Cloud Advisor, uh, we rely on a bunch of them already. Um, there are some that we're not interested in, uh, but, but like the one that you can see with the red dashes, um, these are the one we're actively working on so that we will soon rely on those on those great because they're, um, they're actually very important um, in the context of the VMM, especially the, the Vertigo one. Um, so let's now look at the two main use cases that we, we can we can get um, in the edge context. Um, on one side, we can get what's called a pet VM. Uh, it's usually a manually built and manually managed VM. Um, and because it's I mean it has a very specific purpose uh, from from the user perspective. So uh, sometimes it's about making sure that you can run a five five G um, stack. Um, that's why we we need like accelerators like DPDK, um, things like SPDK in the storage use case uh, context. Sorry as well. Um, we also need like a support for for some kind of management layer and. The most common one is actually Libvirt. Uh, that's why it's important to support the Libvirt API to support this pet VM uh, use case. Um, and the last one is um, about making sure that you can boot those, those pet VMs because they're, they're based on, on cloud images. Those cloud images rely on uh, EFI boots. And so having the support for an EFI firmware is uh, very convenient when you want to boot that kind of image. Um, the other case is called the cattle VM or um, container VM, I, I, I actually prefer. Um, it's basically in the cloud native um, context. You will not manage the VMs directly. Uh, as an end user, what you really want is to be able to run containers and you want to run those containers um, securely. That's why they're eventually run in VMs, but it's totally, totally transparent to you. Um, the, 
the entire management of those VMs is, is done uh, directly by the management layer, which in that case um, comes basically from something like Kubernetes down to Kata containers and then those uh, VMs for you. Um, so it's automatically managed um, uh, and, and that's why it's completely different from the head VM use case we saw earlier. Um, in that context, you can think uh, um, about like when you create a pod, the pod has multiple containers in it. Um, if you're trying to extend the pod at some point in time by adding more containers to it, you're effectively going to need the VM because the, the VM is the pod. You're going to need the VM to, to also be updated in terms of resources. And that's why we need the support for dynamic resource resizing. Um, the, um, the need for the direct kernel boot is coming from uh, basically the, the fact that um, you know about the environment, like that, that's basically kind of containers handling that, and um, the management layer knows exactly what is going to run uh, inside the VM, and for that reason, there is uh, no need for overloading um, the boot with an EFI firmware. Uh, layer. Uh, so with direct current boot, we can shift pretty, pretty fast boot for, for each container. Um, and the last point is about being able to communicate with the, usually uh, what's called a, a guest agent. Uh, so there's this program um, that's running in the guest, managing all the containers uh, on behalf of the host. And the, so that means that the host and the guest uh, must be able to communicate through some virtual circuit. Okay, so now that we looked at all uh, the reason why we did the security, um, how we can achieve the security, um, and also the different use cases we can we can uh, have in in, uh, in the edge context, um, let's look at the cloud hypervisor projects. So cloud hypervisor is a project that has been started in 2019. Um, I Kind of said that earlier, but it basically came from uh, Google's project called CrossVM and AWS project called Firecracker. It's kind of a fork from their from from their project, uh, and then we just added a bunch of things on top of it. The reason why we didn't contribute to the project is because they had a very different scope in mind. Uh, they're trying to 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 tackle different issues, um, and that's why we we couldn't contribute directly to that project. But we're working closely together on the on the Rust VM project. Um, so I think you've got that so far. The Cloud Advisor is basically written in Rust and relies heavily on Rust VMM. Um, the, the main ideas behind the Cloud Advisor project are being able to run modern uh, cloud workloads. And basically, um, we, we we don't want like um, someone to bring like a what we would call a legacy uh, image uh, image or legacy workload and expect like this workload to to run with like a floppy disk because we don't we actually refuse to implement uh, legacy devices such as a floppy disk um, so you simply won't be able to run that kind of legacy uh, workload on Cloud Advisor. Instead, we want to rely on what's more modern, like EFI-based images, uh, relying heavily on power virtualization. And so that leads to my second point, which is um, making sure we have like a minimal device uh, emulation um, uh, in terms of uh, device model. Um, so. We want to make sure that this device model, of course, encompass all the use cases we enumerated earlier, but we want to use power virtualization devices as much as possible. And, and when I'm talking about power, power virtualized, I'm basically talking about Vareo um, devices. Unfortunately, we still have like a few legacy devices, such as like a CMOS or a serial. Um, but that's because if you look at OSs like Linux and, and Windows, 
um, we can't make them boot uh, without those devices. They just assume they will be there. And so there is no other alternative uh, than providing those, those legacy devices directly. Um, the third point is, yeah, we're very opinionated and, and pragmatic about the set of features that, that we accept uh, and that we want to implement simply um, because if there's not a clear need for a feature, well, we we will refuse to implement it. Uh, and if this uh, feature that we're talking about is actually not following um, the modern cloud um, ID that, that we mentioned, uh, we'll not implement it either. Um, so we, talk, we, we already talked about security, but like security is about the, the Rust and the VMM, but not only, it's also about the, the way the VMM has been designed. And by this, I mean like the, the devices that we chose to actually implement. Um, in this context, um, you, can, you can definitely see that um, we're focusing entirely almost entirely on power virtualization because that helps us focus on strengthening only the virtues, which is the communication communication channel between guest and host. But we don't have to like uh, secure every single legacy device that we would have to support. Um, and so that, that makes everything way easier uh, in terms of, of security. Uh, same thing, we decided not to implement vhost um, devices where the backend lives in the kernel because we thought that would uh, give a, a, a too large attack surface to the guest. Um, let's say the guest would escape and and take uh, access uh, get access to the to the host kernel. Uh, that would be kind of dramatic, um, and and that's that's one of also the reason why we chose not to implement specific devices like that, like the vhost uh, kernel ones, uh, even if they actually bring a good performance. Uh, and of course, we're, we're, we're trying to cover the, those two VM uh, use cases that, that we talked about. So cloud providers support multiple architectures, um, x86, 64, and RX64. Uh, we started supporting x86, 64, because the project has been initiated by Intel, obviously. But um, it's important to note that we had um, very nice and uh, contributions from our friends from ARM. Um, they, they've been working super hard on making sure that uh, Cloud Advisor can run an Arch 64 platform as well. Um, and I think we can say that uh, we reached party in terms of features that are supported by both architecture um, right now. Um, so Cloud Advisor, again, has been like, designed in uh, with, with the idea of running on uh, in a type 2 use case on top of KVM but there's there's been recently some some uh, interest from Microsoft and some some contributions basically in pushing for the support of MSHV so MSHV is a kernel module as at the same level as as KVM but the difference is um, it's not the hypervisor itself MSHV is just an abstraction layer to reach out to the Hyper-V hypervisor underneath. Um, so the type one hypervisor that's that's living underneath. So that like allows Cloudvisor to support both um, type two and kind of type one use case. So it's kind of an hybrid hybrid uh, type one here. And that was also the opportunity, this 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 work on supporting multiple hypervisor to 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 um, create a proper abstraction layer on on the hypervisor uh, abstraction in the in the Rust code that we have. Um, so Cloud Advisor supports multiple guest OSs. Uh, we started with Linux, but then with some help from uh, Microsoft folks as well, uh, we've been able to boot um, Windows Guest. And that's uh, something that we're pretty excited about because um, that means that it helped us. It helped us broadening the the scope and the relevance of cloud advisor for our potential customers because we we find multiple workloads which are expecting to run on Windows. 
Mm. So that's that's a good point. Um, then we we have migration. So migration is is quite complex, but it's always been a strong requirement from the CSPs. And the reason for that is CSPs have customers running VMs, and they must be able to migrate um, a running VM from one of their customer within their infrastructure so that they can update the hardware or so that they can update um, the, the software stack running underneath. Um, for all these reasons, they, they, they have a strong need for migration support. And so we do support migration with our advisor, uh, as well as Snapshot Restore, in case you actually want to clone um, an existing VM that you have run. So uh, we're going to now talk about Numa. It's it's really when when it comes to performance that we we start looking at Numa, and and especially in the context of CSPs, where uh, the hardware that they have um, uh, relies very often on multiple sockets. So they have like huge servers with at least two sockets, uh, meaning that the excesses from the socket one. Uh, sorry, from the from the core one to to the RAM on the socket two would take much more time than trying to access the RAM on the same socket. And for that reason, uh, Cloud Advisor ensures that we give full control to the user. So in through our uh, options in the CLI or the uh, HTTP API, we give the the user all the control they need to expose um, Numenotes correctly so that the guest workloads are going to run efficiently and are not going to try to reach um, reach out the, the RAM from another socket from a different CPU. Uh, that would cause um, a huge drop in performance otherwise. Um, the direct <laughs> device assignment use case, uh, that's something that's also called device path through. Uh, it is important when you care as a customer um, about um, when you care about IO performance uh, in the context of virtualization, so you're you are uh, you're running a VM and you want to have access to, for instance, a network card, so NIC, um, to 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 run your workload that that needs to process network packets very quickly. Um, or in the AI computing um, context, you might want to also uh, do some machine learning uh, computation in your VM. Well, you want to have access to a GPU directly. And so direct device assignment means that you attach uh, this device to the VM so that it's no longer available uh, uh, from the host. Um, it belongs entirely to the VM. and it's secure because it, the, this device um, sits behind a physical IOMU, so it ensures that all the DMA transfer, transfers be, between device and the guest RAM are acknowledged before they actually happen. Um, and in terms of performance, because uh, everything happens directly between the device and the RAM, uh, and since there is no VM exit involved, uh, especially when when it supports hosted interrupts uh, for 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 the interrupt handling, well, you can pretty much achieve um, native performance for this device within uh, the VM. And so, obviously, that's a very important uh, use case for us, uh, which which we support in in Cloudflare. So we talked about the dynamic resource resizing in the container uh, VM use case. And so here we're, we'll, we'll see uh, a bit more in details. Um, so first we want to be able to hot plug CPUs. Uh, that means that we want to be able to add or remove CPUs to an existing VM. Um, because for example, you're just adding a new container that requires two more CPUs. So let's add more to the VM so that the container will have access to to those um, to those CPUs. Uh, the mechanism we we'll rely on to is ACPI based to notify the guest about a CPU being added or removed. Um, uh, we have the same kind of um, uh, problem: the memory. So we want to be able to extend or shrink 
the guest memory depending on, on the needs uh, for, from the pod, right? Uh, by adding or removing containers. And here we have multiple ways of, of um, performing this, this um, memory hot plug. Either we have an ACPI based mechanism, the same as the CPU, or we can use two Vertio uh, devices called Vertio Mem or Vertio Balloon. Uh, Vertio Balloon has an interesting feature as well, which is called um, deflate on um, which means that if the guest um, um, runs uh, out of memory, well, the balloon will deflate to give more memory to, to the guest. So that's also something people might be interested in. Um, and uh, the last in, uh, important point is to be able to add or remove devices. So here we're talking about PCI, about PCI devices. Um, and again, it's it's based on the ACPI uh, mechanism to notify the, the guest that a new Vertio block, for instance, has just been added or, or that it's going to be removed. Um, yeah. Uh, now let's talk about the interface um, to, to interact with, with Cloud Advisor. Um, we have the cloud, uh, sorry, we have the command line interface our, um, that's called CLI, but we also have an HTTP API that comes from uh, the Firecracker code base initially that we ported, and it's very convenient um, because you, you might still want to run your um, VM first with with like the CLI, but if uh, during the it, the the runtime of your VM you want to update it as as we just saw with the dynamic resizing, well you need to interact with the VMM to update the VM, and that's that's through this this HTTP API that you can ask CloudVisor to update uh, your VM um, or to get info. Uh, on your VM um, uh, directly from, from there. Um, the HTTP API interface is also um, interesting because that's the interface that's used from both libvirt as well as Kata containers when it comes to um, manage the, the CloudVisor VMM and, and, the, and the underlying VM as well. Um, so in case of Libvirt, there's a Libvirt driver that, that relies on this API and Cal containers interacts directly with, uh, with the API as well. Um, so that's the main uh, interface that's, that's provided to our users. Um, next is confidential computing. Um, Intel SGX uh, is, is the first item. Um, this is something that has been very immersed in the upstream Linux kernel. Um, and we do have the support in Cloud Advisor, which means that from memory enclaves uh, that are encrypted. Um, so that part is handled. On the other side, uh, there is a, an even more exciting technology coming uh, from Intel, which is Intel TDX. And in that case, um, it's still under active development. And that's why we only have like um, an experimental support for it. Um, but the, the, the big selling point of Intel TDX is that we will be able um, um, to run uh, VMs where the guest has full control of the memory, meaning that unless the guest gives access to memory regions to the host, the VMM will not be able to see what the guest can see. And that's um, really confidential computing because here we're talking about uh, even if a, a, somehow a guest was, trying, was able to compromise the host, the host would have no way of stealing data from uh, other guests running on the, on the same machines. Um, so back to security, we also have um, the support for sec seccom filtering. So if you if you look at um, CloudVisor in terms of process and threads, we have like the main um, 
thread being the VMM one. And then it spawns like a bunch of different thread threads for each component. Um, and so here, that's a simple example of where basically we run a VM with a Vareo console, two Vareo blocks, and two vCPUs. Um, um, and you can see that each thread is separately uh, constrained by a, second, uh, a list of second filters. That means that um, they're only authorized to issue a specific list of system calls. And if they try to issue a system call that's not in the list, they will be uh, the entire application, so the entire VMM will be killed by the maybe host kernel. Um, so we've been talking about using power virtualization, power virtualization a lot uh, so far, and of course I've been mentioning about Vertio being this power, virtual, power virtualization uh, layer. Um, and here's the list of de Vertio devices that we do support. Um, so we have Vario Balloon and Vario Mem that we already talked about for uh, resizing the, the guest RAM. There's Vario Block when it comes to um, expose a, a block device. Uh, usually it's the image that we expose to the guest to, to boot the VM. Um, then the Vario Console to, to get input and out output uh, from and into the VM. The Vertio IMMU is a pretty recent one. It's been merged in the uh, in the kernel uh, 514, actually. Um, and it allows um, a guest to see a virtual IOMMU, which means that we can place, we can attach like any device behind virtual IOMMU. And eventually in the nested use case, we can use also VFIO, so this direct device assignment uh, feature to pass uh, the device into a second layer of virtualization. Um, Vertio.net, uh, it's just about, um, of course, providing a network interface to, to the guest. Vertio PMEM is about um, creating a persistent memory device uh, inside the guest. It's it's showing up as, as a block device as well. Uh, Vertio RNG is the Random generator, uh, random number generator device, which can be backed usually by slash dev slash u random on host. Um, and Vario VSOC is um, the virtual socket I was talking about earlier when um, I mentioned uh, we needed like a communication channel between uh, the the host and the the agent running in the guest in the container use case. Um, so after Vario, we have Vios Chooser. So Vios Chooser is basically exposing uh, Vario devices to the to the guest, but on the host side, things are slightly different because it allows to run the backend in a separate process, and it's very convenient because it gives us flexibility um, to to tell our customers like, hey, if you want to come with uh, with your own, if you want to bring your own um, backend for the block device, your own implementation because you have specific needs, then you can do that. You just use uh, the views to your block implementation of Cloud Advisor and you plug your backend into this. Um, if we come back to the discussion about DPDK and SPDK as well, uh, they both rely on um, on VOS chooser pro on the VOS chooser protocol. So if you want to use those software accelerators, you're actually going to need uh, the VOS chooser support. Um, and the last point, which is actually pretty important, is in terms of security, um, by having VOS chooser uh, devices, so by having this backend running in the diff different process, you give um, your, your user and customers the the opportunity to run this different process um, with a specific set of constraint. If they want to constrain it uh, a specific way, they can do that. Uh, it's it's not hard coded in the Cloud Advisor um, uh, implementation itself. Uh, so it gives even more security to 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 our users. 
Um, so VFI user, that's that's a feature I really wanted to talk about. It's a uh, very recent. Um, it's not stable yet, so um, the the implementation is is experimental in Cloud Advisor. Um, but um, it's very interesting because it's kind of like using uh, the the benefit of VOS user, where you're going to run uh, your backend implementation in a different process, so you get all the flexibility in the security. But on top of this, here we're not exposing the device devices to the guest. Instead, uh, those backends are going to uh, be showed as PCI devices inside the guest. So that means that if you come up with like an, an NVMe backend, uh, you plug this into Cloud Advisor, and you will see this NVMe device in your VM being attached to the PCI bus directly. Um, and so the the big benefit on top of the flexibility and security um, is really to to tell our customer, hey, if you actually want uh, to implement legacy devices, now you kind of can. Um, we will not be responsible for you know making sure that those legacy devices are properly implemented because you come up with, with the implementation, but we make sure that the VFIO user implementation is strong and secure um, and then you can just come up with like any device you need so we don't compromise on our motto of, of running a legacy free uh, VMM but we still give the opportunity to potential users to to, to still um, have this legacy device showing up in the, in the guest. And here is um, here is the, a summary of kind of the features we, we went through. Um, so we can see um, different things. The, the features, yes, but we can also see the abstraction layers um, that we have in the code right now. Um, so the CPU manager, the memory manager, and the device manager are the three big components um, to basically And the app hypervisor instruction is the one we talked about. MSHV. Um, and um, that's that's pretty much it. Summary of, of um, the virtualization stack and how Cloudvisor um, define interfaces in there. Uh, before um I'm done with, with the Cloud Advisor section. I just wanted to give a big shout out for all our contributors. Uh, if the project is where it is today, it's uh, part, partially because of them. Um, they've been contributing a lot to different features, uh, as I already mentioned it um, when we, we dug through the features. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to give them a, a big thank you because um, they they helped a lot, and and I'm really looking forward to more contribution from from them. And that's that's what I really like in open source, actually. Um, so uh, I'll I'll finish this presentation uh, quickly, going through the Rust hypervisor firmware. Uh, this was a project. Hypervisor. Um, uh, the idea was to create a very minimal um, firmware that would support uh, modern cloud images, again, uh, and that would be as secure as possible. So that's why we wrote it in Rust. Um, but also, it was important for, for this to be very minimal. Um, and and so the only use case we wanted to support was to boot um, EFI images because that's that's uh, the, the standard for most uh, cloud images right now, uh, at least the the modern ones. Um, and so we want to support the the we want to have this minimal EFI uh, support um, that we can find in bigger project like like Channel Core uh, EDK two, but Again, that was not the goal. We didn't want to end up with like a complex implementation uh, of firmware on this uh, very small one. 
uh, we do have the support for the bootloader specification. So if you also have an image that um, uh, relies on systemd boot, uh, you will be we will be able to to boot this image from from uh, the front end. So it launched as an ELF binary. That's important because uh, that means that if you look at the CloudVisor um, or even the the the, the KMU uh, command line. Um, when you usually do direct kernel boot, you provide the kernel image. Here, the point is to, to avoid modifying uh, any of the command line, you, you can just replace uh, the kernel image with this firmware image directly. And from your disk image, which contain uh, the, the EFI bits, uh, the Rust hypervisor firmware will be able to, to directly boot from it. Um, of course, um, this Rust IPOs of firmware contains a PVH section uh, so that we will be able to, to boot from it. Um, there is support for the GUID partition table uh, in order to read different partitions. And last thing is um, we support only one type of, of block device, and that's basically for a block over PCI. Um, so, uh, if you look at the dash dash disk option, which will basically create a virtual block uh, device for you, uh, and you will pass your image through this uh, through this um, backend. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, the the firmware won't be able to 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 find the the FI image, and, and you won't be able to boot from it. So I'm done with the with the presentation now. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope um, you're interested now in in, in learning even more and uh, about Cloudvisor and, and maybe starting playing with it, um, and of course contributing to it. Uh, so I'm just giving you a, a few links. Um, the th the two first ones are the the repositories for the the two projects. Cloudvisor and Rust Hypervisor firmware, uh, and the third one is the the GitHub organization uh, link uh, that basically gathers all the um, the Rust BMM crates. Uh, you you'll find all of them uh, in in the organization. And the last link is if you have more questions for us, uh, you can reach out on Slack uh, at this uh, URL. Uh, and I am done now, so uh, I'm, I'm going to thank you for, for attending today and uh, see you later.